This is the seventh in a series of messages which are designed to give you an overview of the 66 books of the Bible. We've tried to point out that the message of the Bible is not really to be found just by memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so forth, or the, or the being able to recite a list of the kings or of the judges. But the essence of the Bible is to be found in a message about love. In our last lesson, I mentioned the Holy Spirit, and today's lesson is going to deal in particular with a way that the Holy Spirit enables us to love. Let's go back and talk about just some basic concepts which we find in the Holy Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, the Bible states a general principle. It teaches us that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Wherever there's confusion, you may be absolutely certain God didn't cause it. If there's confusion in your personal life, or in your home, or in the congregation where you worship, or in the country where you live, you may be absolutely certain that God didn't cause that confusion. God's the author of peace, not confusion. We can see that in the Garden of Eden. Everything that God made was absolutely harmonious. There was no bloodshed. A little rabbit could hop down the pathway of the Garden of Eden without any fear. And then along came the author of confusion. And suddenly the peace and tranquility of the Garden of Eden was changed into a jungle where no one was safe. The animals were not safe from one another. Man was not even safe. The author of confusion had done his terrible work. Sin separates. It not only separates us from God, but it also separates us from one another. The word religion is a Latin word which literally means to bind back. It is therefore the purpose of God in Jesus Christ to undo what Satan did to bind us back to one another. First of all, we're bound back to God, and secondly, we're bound back to one another. Our sins have separated us from God and hidden his face so that he will not hear, but our sins have also separated us from one another, and in Christ we have the bridge which God gives to us so that we might once again have the beautiful fellowship with him that we once enjoyed and the fellowship with one another which we need to enjoy. This truth is stated in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. I'd like to read that passage for you because I think it's central to what the message of the Scripture is all about. The King James Version puts it in these words. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, let's talk about Jesus, who is God manifest in the flesh, who comes to bind us back to himself and to one another. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we read that he spent a night in prayer and then selected from his large group of disciples twelve men whom he called apostles. And they're listed for us in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Their names are Simon, whom he also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and James called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Now, these men, some of them were brethren, like Peter and Andrew were brothers, and James and John were brothers. They were also partners in a fishing business. And I used to think that because they were brothers and because they were partners, they were probably real close friends with one another and never had much trouble because they were brethren. Then I began to think about my own family and realize that sometimes brothers do have some real serious disagreements, and sometimes partners have some real serious disagreements, but perhaps more dramatic as far as differing philosophies among the apostolic band was the fact that Jesus, on the one hand, selected Simon Zelotes. Now, the zealots, or the ones called Zelotes, were political extremists. They hated the Romans and anyone who collaborated with the Romans, and especially they hated publicans. And yet Jesus not only selected Simon Zelotes, 
as one of his apostles, but he also selected Matthew the publican. It would be tantamount to selecting a member of the John Burt Society and the Communist Party in the same little band of apostles. It just didn't seem like it would work. But you must recall that Jesus was to be a bridge between people who were divided. That he was to be the one through whom everyone in the world was united, not just political opponents, but people who were divided socially and racially and educationally and in every other way. It was the purpose of God in Jesus to unite everyone, not only in the earth, but even the divergent factions of the heavens. So Jesus prayed all night long, and then he selected from his disciples twelve whom he called apostles and sent them forth. For approximately three years, these men accompanied with him. They ate with him. They were in the same uh, place where he slept, and they learned from him many lessons in life. But for some reason, they never learned to love one another. As they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, they were arguing about which of them would be the greatest. They had read about David, and they knew that Jesus was the son of David, and that David had certain mighty men who were given credit for their various feats of valor and courage. They began to wonder, how are we going to attain greatness, and am I going to be greater than somebody else? And Jesus set a little child in the midst and said, don't you fellows understand that unless you're converted and become like this little child, you won't even enter into the kingdom? A little later on in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find as they were moving down toward Jerusalem that the mother of James and John came with a special request. She said she wanted one of her children on the right hand of his throne and the other on the left hand of his throne. And the Bible teaches us that when the ten heard this, they were moved with indignation. Even when they came up to Jerusalem for Jesus to die, they went into the upper room to observe the Last Supper, and there they were arguing about which of them was the greatest. The 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke is explicit about this. And Jesus told the kings of the Gentiles, argue and fuss, but you're not to be that kind of people. The kingdom I am setting up is going to be diverse and distinct from the kingdoms of this world. Then, according to John chapter 13, he girded himself about with a towel and began to wash their feet. Do you understand what I'm doing, he said. Remember, the whole purpose of the Bible is to teach us about love, and Jesus, as the Word of God, was acting out and personifying the very nature of God in our midst. But up to this point, the apostles of Jesus had been unable to implement in their own lives what love was all about. Then in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 34 and 35, Jesus outlined this startling proposal by saying, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now the Bible had been talking a lot about love, but Jesus gave it a new emphasis. He said, you're supposed to love one another in the same manner that I have loved you. Then he went on to say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Unfortunately in the Christian world, we have wrong priorities many times. We will emphasize this doctrine or that doctrine, but I am convinced in my own mind that Jesus emphasized love greater than any one thing. And we're not to be known by the type of a building where we meet or by some particular ordinance which we may value in the Christian faith, but the one thing which was to distinguish the disciples of Jesus from every other religious group on the face of the earth was the fact that we got along with one another, that we had love one to another. But let's go back and point out again that they were not getting along that very night. They were fussing and fighting as to which of them would be the greatest. That's why Jesus washed their feet. Now the secret of love was to be found in a new nature. And in the next verses of John, the, 14th, the 13th and the 14th and the 15th and the 16th chapters of John, we have what is called the upper room Discourse. If your Bible is a red-letter Bible, you'll find virtually all those verses and all those chapters are in red. It means that Jesus personally was speaking. In the first 58 verses of the Upper Room Discourse, he makes references to love 24 times. And he insists that I'm not going to leave you alone. I have to go away to my Father, but I will not leave you comfortless. I am going to come back, and I am going to dwell in you, and I am going to give you a brand new nature. Many years ago, we bought our uh, little daughter, Mary, a Christian record, 
and she played it so many times that I absorbed that record into me, into my consciousness like uh, by osmosis, if nothing else. And there was a little poem on that record. I don't know who wrote the poem. I don't, we don't have the record any longer. But because our daughter was married, it had a special meaning for our family, and the poem is titled, Mary Had a Little Pig. It goes like this. Mary had a little pig, and it was white as snow. That is, when it had had a bath, as you, of course, might know. But Mary had an awful time to keep that piggy clean for he was just the dirtiest pig that one had ever seen. She'd wash him and she'd scrub him till he'd squirm and squeal as if he wanted her to know it was an unfair deal. And then in the green backyard he'd play from morning until night unless he'd happen to slip right out and lose himself from sight. Poor Mary thought and wondered much what she could ever do. Then she figured out a plan and as she carried through she took him to a doctor who put the pig to sleep. And then he took his heart right out but not of course to keep. Then he took a little lamb and took his heart out too and put it in the little pig before the piggy knew. And when the piggy did awake, he had no more desire to wallow in the mud again or ever in the mire. And so you see, boys and girls, we need a new heart too, just like the little piggy did. The old will never do. I once quoted that to a group of little bitty kids and one kid raised his hand and said, Mister, what happened to the little lamb? Well, that was a rather perceptive question, and I think one with great theological implications. What did happen to the lamb? Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It is because of his death that you and I can have a different kind of a nature. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, he told his apostles. I'm not abandoning you and leaving you all alone. I'm going to the Father, but I will return to you by means of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, just like a hog can be transformed by having a different kind of a heart, our nature is changed because of a brand new spirit a Holy Spirit that we have. Fruit is the outward manifestation of the inward nature. An apple tree has to bear apples if it bears anything. It's its very nature. And you and I, when we have a nature, the nature of Jesus Christ within us, when our nature is transformed and changed, we cannot help but bear the likeness of Jesus. Let me read to you from the upper room discourse. Just to give you some idea. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Now again, what he's talking about, I think, is that he personified love in our midst. And he tells his disciples, you have to be like me. I am the way. You live the kind of life that I have lived. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. In the 15th verse, he said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will pray the Father. He will give to you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the, whom the world can't receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. Now, skipping down to verse 23, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will call to your remembrance whatever I have said unto you. You can't read this section of the Bible without getting the emphasis of love. And when you get to the 15th chapter, he talks about bearing fruit. And he says, You abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. For many years, I thought that bearing fruit meant simply to lead somebody else to Jesus. Well, that may be involved in it, but I think the particular emphasis that we have in this section of the Bible 
is that when you abide in Jesus, you experience this transformation of character so that you become like Jesus. A branch can't do it unless it abides in the vine, and you can't do it. I can't do it without abiding in Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is love. In the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, we have the works of the flesh, and they're manifest. And then they're listed, all these terrible things, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness, hatred, variance, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, revelings, drunkenness, such like. Those are works which the devil creates in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit, and notice that the word fruit is singular, involves nine things. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. In one of our early lessons, we talked about the Bible being a miraculous book. We said that it was like a seed, alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and that it would pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and morals, and that it was a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But Jesus teaches us that a seed really does not manifest life until it first of all dies. That's stated in John chapter 12. If a seed does not die, it abides alone. When you take the seed and you plant it in the ground, all of a sudden the forces of nature begin to work, and for all intents and purposes, the seed dies. But out of its death comes a brand new form of life. Now that's what happens in Christianity. You and I come to the place where we lose our identity. Remember the first great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We absolutely commit ourselves unreservably, 100% to Him, and in essence, we die. And our life is hid with Christ in God. Or, as another scripture puts it, we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Then Paul went on to say, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When Jesus was through with the upper room discourse, and he had washed the disciples' feet, and he had told them over and over and over again that he loved them and that he wanted them to... to manifest his nature to the world, he left the upper room and went on his way toward the Garden of Gethsemane, perhaps stopping in the area of the temple. He prayed, and his prayer is recorded for us in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. It's in three parts. The first part of the prayer is for himself, where he prays, Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The second part of his prayer is for the disciples or apostles whom God had given him. And the third part of the prayer is for you and for me. It begins with verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone. That is, I'm not just praying now alone for my apostles. Well, who are you praying for then, Lord? He said, I am praying for them also which shall believe on me through their word, through their testimony. Now, what did Jesus pray for us? There are a lot of things that we need in the Christian world. We need evangelism, we need generosity, we need prayer, we need people who are willing to be Bible students. But Jesus didn't pray for any of those things. The only one, only one thing he prayed for was that we'd get along with one another. Remember a little earlier he told these men, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now. He goes into this high priestly prayer and he prays specifically that you and I and all believers would be united. Not just that we would be united, but that we would have the same type of unity with one another that he and the Father had with one another. Then he went on to say that the world might believe. Jesus predicated world of, or associated world evangelism on Christian unity. He indicated that you couldn't have the one without the other. When the church becomes united in the same way that he and the Father are united, then the world will believe. 
I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hasn't known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now notice that the Father and the Son and the Christian are to be interwoven together so that in a sense we lose our identity and it is no longer I that live but Christ who lives in me. That's the goal of Christianity. It's the goal of God to sum up in Christ all of the divided factions of heaven and earth. A number of years ago, I was driving my car down the highway and I turned on the radio and someone was talking about the 1885 World Series of Mule Team Competition. And in this competition, the winning team of mules pulled 9,000 pounds to specified distance. Then they hooked the first and second place teams together and mathematically you would predict that they would pull approximately 18,000 pounds. If one team of mules pull 9,000 pounds, and two teams could perhaps pull around 18,000 pounds, maybe a little bit less. I was astonished to hear them say that the, the two teams combined pulled 30,000 pounds. It just seemed incredible. They went on to say that the principle which made this possible was called synergy, S-Y-N-E-R-G-Y. I went to the library and I found a book on synergy which was published by the Macmillan Publishing Company. It's called Synergics by R. Bugging Master Fuller. And uh, I found that uh, synergy is uh, kind of an all-encompassing concept uh, that involves science and chemistry and theology and oh, so many, many things. Uh, the idea is, is that when two things merge in such a way that each loses its identity, a brand new principle in, is involved. Let me give you an example out of this book. The tensile strength of commercially available iron is 60,000 pounds per square inch. The tensile strength of commercial grade chrome is 70,000 pounds per square inch. Of commercial grade nickel is 80,000 pounds per square inch and of commercially available Carbon is 50,000 pounds per square inch. Now, if these various metals are looked upon like links in a chain, you add them all up and you say, well, a chain isn't any stronger than its weakest link. Therefore, a chain made of these various metals will break at 50,000 pounds per square inch, which is the tensile strength of, of carbon, which is the weakest of these various metals. Now, suppose you say, well, let's not make a chain out of them, let's make a cable. Let's take a a strand of carbon, and a strand of iron, and a strand of chrome, and a strand of nickel, and let's combine all of them together. When you do that, you find that the total is 260,000 pounds. But the synergic principle is that you melt them together so that iron loses its identity, and chrome loses its identity, and nickel loses its identity, and carbon loses its identity. When that happens, a miracle takes place, and you have chrome nickel steel that is uh, as strong as 350,000 pounds PSI. And that makes possible the jet engine, for example, this chrome nickel steel alloy. Now, I think what Jesus was getting at in his prayer is that when you and I love him in such a way that we lose our identity, a miracle happens. All of a sudden, we become one with God but not only do we become one with God, we have a tendency to become one with everybody else who is one with God. Jesus is the center, and we converge on him like spokes converging on the hub. The closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to one another. When we make this commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, the scriptures teach that we are buried with him by baptism into death. Remember, the, a grain of wheat, as long as it refuses to die, abides alone. 
But when it dies, suddenly a miracle happens and it begins to produce a new kind of life. And when you and I die to ourselves, we refuse to promote our own plans any longer, and our life is hid with Christ in God, then we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The Holy Spirit does many things in the world, but the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is, produce, is to produce the fruit of the Spirit which is love. May the Holy Spirit, through the Word, be at work in your life is my prayer.